All right, now plague cycles. What do we got with plague cycles? Three reasons for the plagues, okay? These are three reasons why the 10 plagues of Egypt came. The first reason was that it was a judgment on the gods of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, it says basically that he's bringing them out uh, with these plagues in chapter 12. On the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring, and I will bring judgment on their gods. Who is one of the main gods of Egypt? And he says, I'm going to take his firstborn. Pharaoh himself was considered a god, and God says, I'm going to take his firstborn. He's not going to be able to protect his own child. And um, so, yeah. Uh, they mummified them, and so then they basically sent them on to the afterlife. And so, as um, yeah, they, they're, the way they conceptualized their gods, some of their gods got chopped in two. You know what I'm saying? And they had battles between the gods, and one god would kill another god. And you know what I'm saying? So their gods were very human-like and things, some of that that stuff. So, okay, here's the second reason that they may know that I or that you may know that I am Yahweh. God said in the plagues, he's going to reveal who he is. So in the plagues, you're going to see the revelation of God's character, his might, his strength, his power, and uh, this is going to happen here, that they may know that I am Yahweh. Okay, so the plagues are going to reveal his character. And then thirdly, there seems to be this lex talionis nature of it. Okay, now what is lex talionis? We've mentioned this before. Lex means law. Talionis means like retaliation, the law of retaliation, which would mean if I said to you, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, that's lex talionis. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, this law of retaliation. And what you have here, I think, in Exodus chapter 4, 23, is that God says, what has Pharaoh been doing to God's firstborn? Pharaoh has been trying to destroy God's firstborn through killing the infants, through working the daylights out, and through enslaving them. And what's going to happen is, therefore, God says, therefore, because you destroy, were seeking to destroy my firstborn, I'm going to take your firstborn. You, Pharaoh, as God, are not able to protect your own kid. You destroy my kid, your kid's gone. And so there's this kind of like um, eye for eye, tooth for tooth thing, this law of equality, basically. You destroyed my firstborn, I'll take yours. And so you get something like that going on. Okay? Yeah, Eric? I, I, I like agree with that too, and like, but there's like just like, this conflict that's in my head. Like Jesus, like, like taught against that kind of like for us. Like, okay. You know what I mean? Right. So you jump into something like the Sermon on the Mount or whatever, yeah. and like, turn the other what, cheek what, and things like that. I don't know what to make of that. Yeah, that's good. That's New Testament, and we'll leave yeah. the uh, stuff for the New Testament. Um, what I'm suggesting, what I suggest is you've got to be very careful about taking some of the statements in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, and trying to universalize them. Okay? And I know people do that. They try to take statements in the Sermon on the Mount and universalize them. All I'm trying to say is, hmm, it's interesting in the Bible, are there different ways that God himself does stuff? And does God favor shalom and peace? Yes, but are there other times that God's at war? And so you can't take a thing and universalize it like that. And I'm afraid people do that with this. That Jesus is this mamby-pamby, turn-your-other-cheek kind of person. And I think if you read the book of Revelation, uh, he's not too mamby-pamby. And actually, uh, you know, so you got to be careful with that. Okay? Um, but good. it's really good that you feel attention. Because we want to feel attention. We're going to have to wrestle with that. Now, does God harden people's hearts? Does God harden people's hearts... Here you've got some statements. Who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Who hardened Pharaoh's heart? And here you've got a statement here that God hardened it. In chapter 4, verse 21, where we just were, it says, God says, I have given you power to do, but I will harden his heart, Pharaoh's heart, so that he will not let the people go. Okay, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will not let people go. So God says that he will harden Pharaoh's heart. But you know what's interesting? God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Here are a bunch of passages that says, who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? Okay. In other words, did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Yes. Did Pharaoh harden Pharaoh's heart? Yes. So the answer is what? Yes. Okay. In other words, 
Is God involved in activities and is humankind involved in activities? And is this, is this kind of back to the free will predestination kind of thing? Does God determine things? Yes. Does humankind determine things? Yes. Is it possible that you can have two agencies working on the same event? And from God's, from God's perspective, God hardens Pharaoh's heart in judgment on Pharaoh because of the evils that he's done. And God hardens his heart because of the, as a judgment on him. Is it possible Pharaoh hardens his heart in rebellion against God? And so what you have is the same event happening for two different reasons, and God meaning one thing by it, and Pharaoh meaning the other thing by it, and it's the same event. Okay? So who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Yes. Yes, okay. You got, you know, God hardened it, Pharaoh hardened it. Yes, okay, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Stuff, this comes out. Now, ten plagues of Egypt. Okay, ten plagues of Egypt. I don't want you to know all, all of these. I would like you to learn four of them. Okay, and the ones that are in, in, in yellow are the ones that are gold. I would like to, the ones you want. Now the snake, the first plague is the plague of snake. Do you remember Moses cast down his rod? His snake, his rod becomes a snake. The magicians throw down their rods and they become a snake. And then what happens? Moses' snake does what? Eats, Eats them up. Okay. By the way, is a snake a symbol of Egyptian power? What is on the, the, the crown of Pharaoh has what coming out the front of it? A cobra, and so the, the snake is a symbol of, of Egyptian power. What does Moses the snake do? Eats it up, okay, and just destroys it, okay? So the snake is a real famous one. Moses throws it down. Then he strikes the river, and the river becomes what? Like blood red color, okay? So the river becomes blood. Was the Nile considered a god in Egypt? Yes, okay? So the river going to blood is Egypt the gift of the Nile. And so the Nile is taken down in terms of the blood. Now you've got all these other ones, the frogs, gnats, flies, the hail, the locusts, and things. The darkness, why is the darkness important? Yeah, who said that? It's, okay, Ra. Ra or Re. Ra, the sun god. Okay, is the sun god the big god in Egypt? Okay, one of the big gods. And so what God is saying is, I'm going to take the sun god down, and he causes darkness. And then lastly, the firstborn, I think the firstborn is a judgment on Pharaoh, as God, Pharaoh, cannot protect his own son. So those, the snake and the blood, the darkness, as a judgment on Ra, and the firstborn. And uh, they had other gods, like cattle gods. Uh, the one that I'm used to seeing is Hathor, uh, Serebit. Um, Hathor is a, cat, is a cow god, god of wisdom and god of... Uh, yeah, so now this pattern here, here is the pattern of the plagues. God makes an announcement and God tells Moses, okay, Moses, I'm going to do a plague. And then God gives instructions. He says, okay, Moses, take your rod, go down by the river, and you and Aaron go down there. So God gives some instructions. He announces he's going to do a plague, gives some instructions. Moses goes down to the river, strikes the river, turns it red and stuff. And then what do the magicians do? Magicians duplicate. We'll look at the magicians in a minute. The magicians duplicate. I always thought, if the magicians were so powerful, rather than duplicating, they should do what? Undo the miracle. So in other words, Moses strikes the river, it becomes blood. The magicians, if they had any stuff in them, they'd turn it back to water. But they, they duplicate the miracles, and that's interesting. Pharaoh then responds. Usually, Pharaoh, the magicians do it, and then Pharaoh says, you know, please, you know, stop all these flies, stop all these locusts, they're eating that place out. Pharaoh asks for like help and stuff. Moses and God respond, usually in grace, backing off of the plague. And then after, after, after Moses and God back off, Pharaoh's heart gets hardened. And then once his heart gets hardened, Pharaoh's heart hardens, then you start back up on the next plague. So this is a cycle. C can you see how the, all the plagues kind of ran through this cycle? And Pharaoh's heart gets hardened and it starts again the next cycle. And this is kind of a, a cycle that happens in the book of uh, Exodus on the 10 plagues. Now, the magicians. The magicians actually are a foil to Moses. And so the magicians are really pretty important in the narrative because initially the, Egypt, the magicians oppose Moses. And so they are a foil to Moses. Moses does a miracle, the magicians duplicate it. And so initially, they, the magicians oppose Moses and Aaron and they are a foil, they, they, they duplicate what Moses does. And uh, so there's an opposition. But what happens, interestingly enough, is during the gnats, the plague of the gnats, the Egyptian magicians can't pull it off. And the Egyptian magicians say, this is the finger of God. 
And so what you have is the magicians go through a transition. They oppose Moses, but now in the end they become testimony, they become witnesses of Moses' power and God's power through Moses. And so what you've got is the magicians now become testimonies. They become witnesses of God's power, and they give up saying, Moses, they say, Pharaoh, 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 this, is, uh, this isn't just magic tricks anymore. This is, this, this is the finger of God. And so the magicians actually become a witness. They oppose Moses, but then later they become a witness to Moses. And so it's an interesting transition that the magicians go through this transition. And... Uh, Here's another thing that happens during the plagues, is there seems to be a separation in the land of Goshen. Like, does anybody remember when the hail came in and the hail is, is bombing out Egypt and, and destroying everything? But over in the land of Goshen, it's all sunny and nice and things. And so God separates his people in the land of Goshen, and the plagues only fall in Egypt. So there's a separation of Goshen where the Israelites live, and basically the plagues don't fall on them, and God protects, basically God protects his people. As he's bringing judgment on others, he, he protects his people and stuff, and so that's kind of a neat thing.